Hi learners and a warm welcome to my session on teaching learning methods for EVS project work. My name is Russell D'Souza and uh, I teach as assistant professor in education at Nirmala Institute of Education, Goa. I assure you that this session would be enriching and interesting for you. The structure of my session goes this way. We start off with the concept of projects, the rationale or the justification for projects, the different steps that are involved in project work, the different types of projects, and of course we close with assessment of projects. Well, the project method that we have heard about several times is based on a philosophy as the philosophy of pragmatism and the principle of learning by doing. So the learner does and by way of doing, he learns. So in this method of learning, the pupil act actively constructs knowledge. So this means that he is a creator of knowledge or he may be verifying a body of knowledge. Many a times, we do not give scope to children to verify knowledge, but projects do allow children to verify knowledge that is available to them. Simply put, the student acquires a deeper knowledge or a deeper understanding through active exploration of the real world challenges and problems. So this helps children to see different types of relationships. It helps them to display creativity and most important, it allows children to learn to question. And when I say question, I mean why, what, when, where, how, who. So these are different types of questions that children start coming up the moment they start interacting with the world around them. And this is the reason why we say that projects actually help a child to come up and to come forth with things that are within him. There are three definitions that I would look at. The first one is according to Kilpatrick. Now he says that a project is a wholehearted purposeful activity proceeding in a social environment. I want you to look very, very carefully at the, at the words that I have highlighted. I have highlighted purposeful activity and social environment. The second one according to Ballard, this person says that a project is a bit of a real life that has been imparted into schools. Back again, I want you to focus on the words real life and uh, according to Thomas and Long, this person says that projects is a voluntary undertaking which involves constructive effort or thought and eventuates into objective results. Once again, I want you to look at the words I have highlighted. That is constructive effort, thought and objective results. So if I take all these words that I have highlighted and string them together, it would tell us that projects basically is a purposeful activity and it takes place in a social environment. So a purposeful activity taking place in a social environment. Now this social environment could be in the class, it could also be outside the class. So it's a purposeful activity which takes place in a social environment. It takes place in real life. That's the most important thing. So real life, there is a constructive effort that the learner makes in which there is a lot of thought, a lot of reason, a lot of deliberation that comes in, which leads eventually into results, results which are objective. So, taking all these three definitions, I have coined a working definition for you as far as projects is concerned. So, let's come down to concept of projects. Now, when you talk about projects, the world over, they talk about project-based learning, uh, which is abbreviated as PBL. So, it means project-based learning. Now, the very first thing here is that Projects is a student or learner-centered 
learning method. Now, you as learners have come across different methods of learning. Methods of learning that are teacher-centered, methods of learning that are group-controlled. But when you look at projects, it is a student or learner-centered method of learning. What does that mean? It means that the focus of instruction is shifted from the teacher, the traditional teacher, who, you know, sometimes people say, stand on a pedestal. So, the instruction is shifted from the teacher to the learner or the student. So, this means that the learner has a larger control, has a lot of flexibility, he has autonomy, he has independence, he has every reason to think, to deliberate, to investigate, to manipulate. So, the control of learning lies in the hands of the learner. So the learner becomes responsible for his learning, the learner becomes accountable for his learning, and the learner is independent in his learning. And so, I would say by using these words, I do, and so I learn, I do. So, students remember that I do and I learn are very, very important words when it comes to project-based learning. So, projects. Where can we conduct them? Traditionally, we know that projects are conducted out of class, but they can be conducted in class as well. So, projects can be done within the classroom, they can be done at home, they can be done in ICT labs that we have in our schools, they can be done in the school libraries, they can be done anywhere in the community. So, the thought of project work now shifts from the classroom, to the home, to the community, just anyway. The next uh, characteristic is that the learner may work alone. Now we know that traditionally uh, projects would mean that a learner would work all by himself. But today we talk about a very important concept and that's called social learning or social constructivism, wherein the learner, he tries to work along with others. others in collaborative groups. So that means the learner is working as a part of a team and a team which has a common goal and which has a common purpose. So learning in project work is no longer individual, but it becomes interesting, becomes enriching, it becomes satisfying and children learn to accept the views and ideas of others when they start working in collaborative groups. The focus of projects is on real-world learning. And when I say real-world learning, I mean interaction of the student with the real world. For example, there was a teacher who told the students that they have to do a project earthquakes. And so the students asked the teacher, teacher, how do we do a project on earthquakes? And the teacher said, um, she said, uh, you go to the library or you look at the newspapers, you look probably at the internet resources and write something about projects. And there was the student in this particular classroom who told the teacher, he said, ma'am, do you know I have experienced an earthquake? I'm a witness to an earthquake. I know what has happened. I've seen people losing their lives. I have seen my family members losing their lives. So, when we look at projects, it's always good to look at projects that function in the real world. So, projects that function in the real world, in the natural settings, in a social context. So, projects help us to take our students beyond the walls of a classroom. And since learning occurs in the natural surroundings, the experience therefore becomes extremely satisfying it becomes meaningful, it becomes realistic, and it becomes highly experiential for a learner. But the question that you may ask me is, is it possible to have projects in every single topic in EVS? Well, it depends on the teacher. It depends on how resourceful the teacher is. It depends on how tactful the teacher is. It depends on how inclined the teacher is towards project work. 
So, yes, it is possible to have a project for every single topic. It is possible. I would like to present to you an example of a community-based project. Now, when I say a community-based project, this project was conducted in the community. And uh, this project talks about the type of vaccines that are administered on infants and children from zero to six years by parents in their locality. So, the objective of this particular study was to find out the type of vaccines that are administered on infants and children who range between zero to six years. And the children had to visit 50 houses in their neighborhood. And the tool that they made use of is a checklist. Now, we know that vaccines are extremely important. And, of course, we talk about the importance of vaccines in school. But do you see how I have translated a thought into an action? An action that is going to take place in the community. Let us have a look at how the students went about doing this particular project. It's very interesting. Have a look at this. So, the checklist had vaccine type on one side and, uh, of course, the other side, it had, you know, the boxes as yes and no. And after going to 50 houses, this particular group of students brought in this data uh, to the institution. And if you look very carefully, you will see that uh, there are different vaccines which I mentioned here. For example, you have hepatitis B, you have the DTP, the poliomyelitis, the rotavirus, influenza vaccine, the MMR, the HIV, and the pneumococcal. And on the other side, you will find the, the number of infants who were given these vaccines. So if you look at hepatitis B, it's 21. You look at uh, DTP, 20 poliomyelitis 45, rotavirus 5, influenza 10, MMR 15, HIV 10, and pneumococcal 10. Now, having this data makes no sense to us. This data needs to be organized and it needs to be put in some format which will make sense to the other learners and to any other person in the school or any other member in the community. And so, this data that the students brought was translated into a graph. So if you look very carefully at the graph, you will see that the polio vaccine or the poliomyelitis vaccine is the one that is given the most. It's given the most to almost about 43, uh, 43 uh, infants and children. And if you look very carefully, rotavirus is given to just five infants or children, which tells us that a community is still not aware and educated about vaccines. So, if a teacher is vigilant, a teacher can initiate this type of projects which are known as community-based projects. These give a lot of information, a lot of first-hand learning to our children, which otherwise in the classroom is very difficult for children to acquire. Now, what is the rationale for our projects? We see that curiosity flourishes. For example, which of the two, that is a mango sapling or a cactus has longer roots? Which of the two has longer roots? Children don't know. Let them find out. Get students to think, reflect, they formulate their own strategies, they learn to act, they learn to observe. In other words, it facilitates something known as social constructivism. In fact, it is very important to get children to think, to reflect. Let them learn to use higher order cognitive processes. Because all this while, we have always looked at the lower order thinking. It's time that we start facilitating. It's time that we start getting students to work with higher order learning. It encourages children to question and to test theory. Very, very important to question. We want our children to learn to question why something happens and to test theory. For example, uh, the human tongue and the taste that it senses. Our textbook talks that the human tongue senses four different tastes. 
in my other session, we will have a look at it. How effective has the Project Tiger been in our country? What is the approximate tiger population in India as of December 2017? So do you see how recent information I am looking at? It develops process skills. When I say process skills, it, I mean the skills like observation, the skill of recording, the skill of manipulating materials, collecting information, computing, interpreting, and so on. This means that the child has to also develop process skills. And when we teach, our focus of teaching EVS is largely product-based. But we need to look at process skills. And process skills come into existence the moment we initiate projects in our learning and in our teaching. It helps students to understand the scientific method. When I say the scientific method, it is the method that scientists make use of. Starting with the problem. What is the problem? How do I formulate hypothesis? What relationships do I want to be established? How do I go about collection of data? How do I test this hypothesis? Because hypothesis testing is extremely important. Please note that we either accept hypothesis or we reject hypothesis. We accept or reject. We do not prove them right or we do not prove them wrong. To give an example here, I would say design an experiment to demonstrate that the local baker's bread is the best. How would you go about conducting an experiment to demonstrate that the bread that the local baker bakes is the best. It also helps to develop scientific attitude among students. What natural remedies could you suggest based on your experiments to ward off mosquitoes, knowing that the chemical preparation that we make use of, like mats, repellents, coils, are dangerous for our health. So what natural remedies can the learners suggest that will ward off mosquitoes? Well, this calls for a lot of work because we are looking at the word natural remedies. In other words, we are trying to bring children closer to nature. We are trying to take children away from chemical preparations because they are dangerous for our health. It makes learning interesting and entertaining for a learner. So, do the mosquitoes still bite even if you apply a lotion of cocoa butter aloe vera? Now, this calls for a serious investigation. A research on uh, cosmetics tells us that a mosquito bites scar. So, when a mosquito bites, you do get a scar. So, research tells us that a mosquito bites scar can be faded off. That is, you know, it vanishes over a period of time after applying cocoa butter or aloe vera. So, if the scar disappears, can it ward off mosquitoes. Projects encourage investigative learning. For example, what are headlands? We hear about headlands. What are headlands? What is their nature? Where are they found in India? So this is something very interesting for learners. Well, I have a visual for you uh, wherein uh, we talk about a headland. Have a look at this. This is a headland and this is in Goa. So, it's, it's a portion of land that is surrounded by water on three sides. So, where are headlands found in India? So, that is what the children have to find out. So, it also imbibes a value of honesty, integrity, cooperation, concern. It develops problem-solving skills in students. It encourages independent and collective thinking in students develops appreciation for the work of scientists. Very important because the moment we learn to appreciate the work of scientists, we start working like scientists. Helps to make scientific ideas clearer to students. So thus we can say that there is a close relationship that exists between four entities. And these four entities are the learner, the peers, the school and the community. So the learner, in other words, he interacts with peers, the school and the community. So all these four entities now start working in synchronization, which is very important. So there are different steps in project work. Uh, so we start with the pre-activity stage and in here we start with the problem. So what is the problem? 
Encourage children to pick or choose a problem. As teachers, we need to do it. Help children to write the objectives and the hypothesis. Planning the execution of the project. How would they go about executing the project? What are the sources of information that they would look at? What are the risks or challenges that children would encounter? How would they document and report? The next thing is planning the organizational details of the project. How would I, how would I structure the whole project? How would I go about organizing the whole project? Uh, preparation, identification of data collection tools, very, very important. Would I make use of a questionnaire? Would I make use of an interview? Would I make use of a checklist? What tools would I make use of? And where would I get these tools? We look at the activity stage. Now, the activity stage is concerned with the actual conduct of the project. You need to be very careful about a couple of things here now. The target group and the manner in which you administer the tool. You need to cross-check the data collection tools before you administer the tools. Very, very important. You need to check the apparatus that you are making use of. Check for workability. You will execute the tasks in the right sequence and collect the needed data and keep it organized. So, the teacher ensures that the students are collecting relevant information. So, the teacher is working in the background, monitoring and supporting. So, the teacher needs to be understanding. The role of the teacher changes from teaching to facilitating. And that's why we say a teacher becomes a facilitator in project-based learning. Now, the third activity is the post-activity stage. In here, we bring the data together, so we say it's compilation of data, we analyze the data, and we start interpreting the data. So, compilation, analysis, and interpretation, and we need to close the project with reflection on the whole experience. What was my experience? Because your experience is very important. So we document learning that has taken place. Now there are different types of projects that can be conducted in EVS. The first one is experiment or investigation. And these projects are the most common types of projects wherein we make use of the scientific method to propose and to test a hypothesis or many hypotheses together. For example, build different hollow cups using aluminum foil of the same size and shape. Float them on water. Which hollow cup can hold the most mass? Try this out with your learners and let them find the answer to this. Which hollow cup can hold the most mass? Now, teachers, you need to be a little careful with the words weight and mass. They are two different things. The next type of projects are demonstration projects. So, demonstration projects usually involves retesting an experiment or an idea. So, the example for you here is, does grey water affect plant growth? I'm talking about grey water, that is domestic water from bath cubicles, bathtubs, sinking, sinks, washing machines without fecal contamination. So, does it affect plant growth? Then, the third one is a model based wherein Children construct models. So, construct a model to show the different type of teeth that we have. Children should know, of course, the different types of teeth that we have. Many a times they do not know about this basic fact. Collection is collection type of projects when we collect different types of materials or specimens. So, here we can have examples like rock collections or animals in a specific family. Assessment of projects is a very, very important thing that we as teachers need to be careful. There are, there are three types of tools that can be used. They are, known, they are checklist, rating scales, and rubrics. They are not the same. They are different. So, when I look at a checklist, I have taken a simple illustration. And the illustration talks about the methodology wherein I talk about objectives are clearly stated, the data collection tools are clear, the data collection protocol is systematic and logical. So here you will find yes or no. So are the objectives clearly stated? Yes, if it's yes. No, if it's no. 
Data collection tools, are they clear? Yes, if they are yet clear. No, if they are not clear. So checklist, you got to be careful that it's yes, no, present, absent, true, false. The next one that we look at is rating scales. So here we rate performance on a continuum from positive to negative. The same examples. So for example, objectives are clearly stated. If they are clearly stated, you would say strongly agree. If they are not clearly stated, you would strongly disagree. Or if you are undecided, you will mark undecided. The third one is rubrics. Now, rubrics are different from rating scales and they are also different from checklist. A rubric will specify the criterion and the criterion here is methodology and the extent of performance. For example, statement of objectives, they are clear and comprehensive. Have a look at this. They are less clear and less comprehensive. They lack clarity and comprehensiveness. So if the statement of objectives is very clear, you would say it's clear and comprehensive. If the data collection tools are clear, then you would say it's clear and comprehensive. If it lacks clarity, then you would say lacks clarity and comprehensiveness. So what is the role of the teacher? The role of the teacher has totally changed. So the role of the teacher sometimes would be as a facilitator and sometimes it would be as a manager. So as a facilitator, the teacher would work with the students. You would help them to frame relevant and meaningful questions. You would help them to present logical arguments. You would guide the students. You would help them maybe in answering questions. And the second one is the role as a manager. So the teacher also becomes a manager. So putting the whole thing together, we would say that project-based learning is an inquiry-based learning in which the learner is encouraged he is motivated to learn by himself, for himself, under the guidance of a teacher. My dear teachers, try different types of projects and you will be, you'll be interested and you will be happy when children come up with their own innovative and novel ideas. Thank you very much.